almost on time. Um, so welcome to this uh, presentation about AppArmor, um, or more exactly, uh, regarding the enhancing Linux security by application hardening. So the, today's agenda is um, we'll do some um, short introduction about um, in-vehicle infotainment, the business where we work in, and then some um, security risks and the motivation for application confinement, um, intro to up armor, and then um, some um, dive in into the security policies for the applications and uh, some uh, pros and cons in the end, and hopefully uh, some time for questions. Um, so this picture might have looked quite uh, futuristic maybe 10 years ago, but uh, nowadays it's uh, pretty mainstream, at least in the EV market. And um, on the left-hand side, uh, there's a bunch of IVI system uh, requirements uh, that could come from a customer. This is just an example, not a um, yeah, exact uh, requirement from uh, any customer, but um, there is a bunch of, you can see, a bunch of interfaces and um, use cases, and um, bottom line is there's uh, lots of different applications uh, that, uh, especially those uh, that uh, communicate to the outside world and those that um, uh, handle um, sensitive data, they need uh, special attention uh, regarding security. And uh, that's where we, as the security team um, at uh, Bosch side in Lund, come into the picture. Uh, so there are lots of um, software teams that are developing uh, different applications for the head unit, which you can see here also the in the picture, the box which uh, usually is uh, placed behind the screen uh, in the middle of the dashboard, um, which every car has. Um, so we are helping these teams to, um, to implement or to enhance uh, security solutions to, to uh, develop new ones and uh, in general we are driving changes uh, uh, not only the state of the art but we are trying to do beyond uh, that one uh, so as uh, as you all know there's um, uh, there are lots of changes uh, currently happening in the automotive industry and it's not only related to the uh, changes in the drivetrain, but it's also, of course, the, the previous picture that you have seen, um, the changes in the cockpit and um, uh, infotainment system. Uh, but um, besides this, there is also uh, lots of research and work done in the for the regarding automotive driving and uh, vehicle to X communication, which you can see different options here on the picture. Um, overall, again, there is uh, lots of more things to be uh, secured. Um, I, I remember uh, some years back when I was thinking about all of these changes in the automotive industry, I was thinking about uh, the mobile phones because the cars they are becoming or at that time they were becoming more and more like a mobile phone so we have lots of knowledge uh, in this region um, I also my background is in telecom business so when it comes to the security that's a piece of cake there's no no issues we will be able to handle it um, but it's much more much more than that and um, uh, there are also some um, there are lots of examples with um, um, remote car hex. Oh, what's this? <laughs> yes. Oh. 
maybe you can take your um, <laughs> mm. Let's see if this works, yes. So <coughs> here I just listed a uh, few of the um, uh, famous uh, remote car hacks and um, the list can be made uh, much longer. Um, I'll just tell you, uh, probably the most known one is this uh, Jeep Cherokee hack where a couple of researchers um, managed to find out a password uh, for the Wi-Fi in the car, uh, which was uh, generated, so the password was genera generated automatically at the man manufacturer site, um, uh, and it was based on the, um, the year and the month of the car production, so it wasn't uh, really difficult to find out. Uh, so once they managed to find out this password and uh, they could uh, connect to the vehicle, and they could control some basic uh, functionality in the car, like a uh, radio volume, and they could also track the car with the GPS. But then uh, when they put a little bit more effort, they could also change the software in the head unit, and then they could uh, connect this, uh, uh, the head unit, which is connected through the CAN buses uh, to all ECUs, electronic control units in the car. And these um, Modern cars, they have uh, typically more than 100 ECUs controlling everything possible uh, from uh, the engine, um, brakes, uh, steering wheel, and uh, stuff like that. So they could take over basically the, yeah, e everything uh, in the car. So it's um, uh, quite a big problem. Um, but uh, as I said, this is uh, just a matter um, of the of the time and the effort you put, so basically each and every car is hackable. So, but you you need um, um, to to put as much protection as possible to at least uh, make this uh, time frame very long. So it's uh, uh, or make it difficult for the hackers. So, what we have discovered then uh, in our applications that a uh, few of them if I put it nicely, uh, we're not that secure and uh, we needed to, to find a solution uh, how to protect them. And then uh, since um, uh, we are not that uh, much uh, experts uh, in any of the solutions that I just listed here, um, uh, we, we were, uh, yeah, speaking around with our colleagues, uh, finding out, reading ourselves. Um, and um, yeah, if you just uh, go out uh, to the streets of Lund and uh, ask uh, average people what kind of solutions they would pick, they would probably without hesitation say, yeah, SE Linux, that's the, that's the best uh, solution. Um, but since um, yeah, at least I can speak for <laughs> personally. Uh, I'm just a mediocre uh, engineer. I'm lazy, maybe. Um, I, I want to have the stuff that is simple to learn um, cre and uh, create and uh, review. And uh, so that's why AppArmor was our choice. Um, it is uh, path-based and um, uses the principle of uh, least uh, privilege, uh, and it confines individual applications um, and it's already uh, uh, part of the kernel uh, as a uh, yeah, Linux security module. Uh, even though you are all of course familiar with this, I, I need to talk uh, about some, some basic stuff before we start diving into the up armor topic. So discretionary access control, it's um, 
uh, typical Unix-based Unix um, uh, access uh, control where the user uh, itself decides the access rights for the file with uh, typical this read, write, execute for the user groups and others. And it's uh, yeah very easy to maintain, but on the other hand, it, uh, it provides uh, a low level of protection because, of course, we can't uh, trust engineers uh, to do everything right. Um, this is also an example of uh, where uh, the user has access to the three first file you see here and not to the fi file number four, uh, since uh, he's not of part of that group, for example. And then uh, on top of this, we have a mandatory access control, uh, which doesn't replace the DAC uh, discretionary access control. It's just an additional layer of security. Um, and uh, for the MAC rules, in order for them to, to be valid, uh, the DAC rules need to be passed or evaluated first. And uh, so this kind of the control is um, typically centrally controlled by few security aware people. And of course, it's also more effort to, to maintain this. So app armor or application armor um, is a Linux security uh, module. Um, it is uh, or one of the uh, implementations, and it exists in the kernel version 2.6.36. Um, it uh, comes uh, in some uh, distributions by default. There's Ubuntu, OpenSUS, Apertis, and so on, and there will be more talk about Apertis later on. Um, uh, that it provides Mac, I already told you, and it for confines program and it's path based, so that's the basic features. And this is an example uh, of a profile that's the, the name uh, that AppArmor uses, it's um, security policy files. Um, the files where you write uh, your access rules. Uh, so it's important to mention that these uh, rules, um, they don't override uh, the rules that you have already in the set or in the DAC permissions, for example. Uh, in this picture, uh, as we said, the user has access to the three first file. And let's say that uh, uh, by Mac, we specify that we should have access also uh, for the file number four and also for the no file number three, so these two files. So what happens then is that uh, this uh, application running under these Mac rules will only have access to the file number three, which you can see here um, in green. And why, why is that? Uh, that's because um, the Mac doesn't allow us permissions to the file uh, one and two, and even though we specify by the Mac that we should have access to file num number four, we are not allowed to do that because that is not even this rule is not even passed by the DAC. So, as some other LSMs, um, Parma also has uh, modes of operations, and it's uh, uh, called uh, in the Parma language enforce and complain. The first one is blocking all the violations. The second one is um, allowing violations, but both of them, they are logged. So you can see what is actually happening on the system. And the second one is typically used for the uh, profile uh, development, maintaining and uh, debugging. Um, App Armor and these uh, profiles that are used by it are very easy to read, it's a hu they're human readable and um, uh, loaded uh, into the kernel typically on boot and uh, they are stored under etc app armor d directory and uh, the file itself, uh, it's yeah very flexible. And as you can see here, you can have this uh, C style include statements and variables and uh, you can use different kind of uh, refinements uh, for your profiles as a child and heads and so on. So now I'll uh, hand over to... 
this. Maybe we'll do this a bit quicker, but yeah, basically, um, like we started off, right, we have a lot of software being developed and security is always fun, right? That's <laughs> um, but no, but we need to make this easy for developers to use and, and we need to make it in, in a way that it actually gets implemented instead of something, you know, um, boring security things you want to avoid. Um, so the language allows for quite uh, flexible means of writing um, profiles to confine your applications. Um, so you have things like capabilities, network, R limit, um, and you can yeah, <coughs> allow execution of, of different programs and you can have things like globbing and uh, yeah. Uh, we'll skip this one, it's just a listing of, of of different ways you can write things and, and maybe jump in a bit to an uh, example here. So um, so this on the left hand side we have an actual profile. Uh, on the right hand side we have some yeah script. Uh, might not make too much sense what it does but um, let's dig into this a bit. So for some reason we write something to a file and then we read one file and then we read another file. Um, and since for whatever reason we want to confine this script, right? We don't want it to be able to do other things than it should. Um, so we write a profile for it. Um, so on the left hand side we start off with, uh, we have some include statements. Anyone writing C code can relate to what that does is basically taking the content of those um, files that we include and place um, at the point of the include statement. And that's a matter of not having to rewrite the same rules everywhere. Um, so basically you can um, abstract things a bit and, and reuse parts of your profiles uh, in, in more than one place. Um, so there are pre-made um, include files for things like using bash or um, writing to the console, for example, like we do here in the script. Um, and then we have something where we explicitly allow our script to uh, execute the, the bin bash binary. And, and we also specify here that um, when bash is executed, it, it shall be confined under the same profile as our script here. Um, so there's different ways you could do it in, in, in specifying a, a specific profile for Bash or having it under the same profile or, or things like that. So, and we do the same for cat and, and then we also say that we are allowed to read ourselves the, the file that has our script uh, content here. Um, and then we have some um, allowing read and write to this uh, file if we are the owner to it, this this home uh, slash foo um, file. And also to this temp bar file, we allow read access. So that's basically it, what, what this profile does, um, what it looks like to, to confine this application. Um, and then we have a bit more advanced one. Um, so some of the things here are similar. We can skip the first parts, but um so our script here really doesn't do much right we we grab for things but for some reason we don't want um grep here um so you have this line no <laughs> okay let's see uh this line here we say that when we execute the grep binary we should change to a different profile we should not confine under the same profile as, as the main script here, but we have instead written a, a specific profile for, for the graph binary. Um, and here we, again, we include some things to not have to write it ourselves, but um, we have some, some specific things here. For some reason, we want to audit whatever we read. Um, so that will generate sort of uh, system logs on, on all the files that we touch. Um, 
and for whatever reason we want to deny read access to um, yeah this .ssh folder um, anything that's in there. Um, so this is just examples. Um, I mean they they don't necessarily make too much sense, but just to show you a bit of of, of what you can do here and, and how you can use it and the fact that it's actually uh, human readable. Uh, I mean you can put it into Garrett and review it and and and, and have it as part of your code, right? Um, so <laughs> again, we need to make this easy, right? So what kind of tools do you have? Accessible, right? Otherwise, you don't you don't want to do this everything by hand, right? So there are some nice tools that come here with the app or utils package. Um, we don't have time to go into them, but basically you can switch between complain and enforce mode, and you can have some help writing these um, profiles to not have to open your editor. Um, so there's basically two ways to do this, right? Writing a profile. Uh, one is opening your editor of choice, um, write the thing, save it, close it, and reload up or more profiles, right? Um, but <laughs> giving this to like 20 development teams and a lot of people doing things, I mean, that's more things they need to spend learning and more time they need to spend doing things that are not sort of Yay, security, right? <laughs> That's not on, on everyone's top of the list, right? Um, so there's other ways, right? You, you can have these tools help you out a bit. Um, so, for example, you have this where you can open like two terminals. You open uh, in the first one, and then you have a gen proof, uh, and you specify which executable you want to profile here. Uh, and then in the second one, you run your program, you execute it, you, you make it run, you make it touch files on the system, do things. And then you go back to the terminal with genproof and you basically tell it to uh, scan. So what, what has this application done? Um, so what AA genproof does is basically creates an empty profile. Um, and this profile is put in complain mode, so the profile doesn't allow anything, but it's a complain mode, so everything would be violation and then everything would be logged. And then it scans for these logs and it presents you with sort of options on how you can um, make them disappear. So basically suggesting ways of adding rules to make them go away. Um, and then you can repeat this process until you have no more violations basically. And then you have a profile covering your, um, yeah, the, the, the trails that you have made from, from violations. Um, so this is going a bit faster. How are we on time? Yeah, sorry. Pros and cons. Like as we said, easy development of profiles kind of high on our list um, for reasons. Um, that's pro from us. Um, you have these tools. You can do the whitelisting. You you explicitly say what you should do, and you don't sort of deny what you shouldn't. Um, you have decently granularity on, on a lot of, lot of things, some parts better than others. Um, you have this sort of uh, also touching, maybe not necessarily security, but you have on, on the resources and maybe more on a sort of DDoS uh, mitigation parts. And, and you have these nice things that you have. Uh, you can make it a bit modular, right? You can include parts. You don't have to rewrite and copy things between different profiles for different applications. Um, and you can select how the child processes should be confined, um, either having more open space to play with or, or more restrictive than, than the, the parent profile that can be um, easily uh, made. Some cons, um, yeah, as always, you can take shortcuts. Um, yay, we use up armor, but all the profiles are wide open. Yeah, maybe false sense of security there, um, as always. So you do need to have some <laughs> some people that at least thinks about security and and maybe have that reviewed um, somehow and and get that into the the process of of developing um, this. And yeah, profiles can be uh, large, complex. 
Um, yeah, and you need to keep it alive with the code, right? So if you change your code, you need to change your profile and, and you need to test it and make sure that it works. Um, yeah, so I think um, we have to stop here, right? Otherwise we're running too much over time. All right, questions? Yeah. Then I can maybe mention. So <laughs> sorry for the speeding through this, but we we have actually written some of this down as some more of a uh, guide that is actually available at the Pertis uh, webpage. So nice handover to <laughs> maybe to the next topic. Um,